Netanyahu not backing down on Gaza. Speaking to the U.S. Congress, the Prime Minister remained a defiant defender of Israel's assault. Buoyed by standing ovations and proclaiming a battle of good versus evil, his supporters reconfirmed their commitment. But can the U.S. continue to stand by a leader unpopular with his own people and much of the world? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Benjamin Netanyahu. It's hard to reconcile the rapturous applause with the protests just outside Congress, as well as in numerous cities and universities across the United States. To many, Benjamin Netanyahu is a war criminal, responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of innocent Gazans. But for others, he is the respected leader of a key U.S. ally who's working in the defense of U.S. and Israeli interests. Here's a look now at Netanyahu's speech before Congress and the controversial relationship with his most powerful ally. They've been friends for decades, but behind the smiles, the war in Gaza has considerably soured the relationship between Benjamin Netanyahu and Joe Biden. Not that there was any hint of that as they met at the White House. Well, welcome back, Mr. Prime Minister. We've got a lot to talk about. I think we should get to it, but the floor is yours. I want to thank you for uh, 50 years of public service and 50 years of support for the state of Israel. And I look forward to uh, discussing with you today and working with you in the months ahead on the great issues before us. And that's why on your head. A rather less cordial welcome for the Israeli leader outside the White House. An unflattering effigy and gallons of fake blood to represent the very real bloodshed in Gaza. Quite a contrast from Netanyahu's reception in Congress on Wednesday. It's a clash between those who glorify death and those who sanctify life. For the forces of civilization to triumph, America and Israel must stand together. The Israeli leader cheered to the rafters as he called on the US to join forces against what he described as their common enemy, Iran. Because when we stand together, something very simple happens. We win, they lose. Netanyahu received numerous standing ovations. But although officially a bipartisan invitation, this was very much a Republican Party initiative. Dozens of Democrats boycotted the speech, a clear snub to the Israeli leader. But was it also a message to his nation as a whole? Support for Israel is in the very DNA of modern America. The US was the first country to recognize the new nation back in 1948. And ever since then, it's provided it with diplomatic cover at the United Nations and billions of dollars in funding. But there are signs that support is beginning to fracture, particularly among the younger generation. The plight of the Palestinians in Gaza has prompted protests at college campuses across the country. And US support for Israel is threatening to cost the Democrats votes in the crucial swing states, which will determine November's election, much to the detriment of the relationship between the two old allies. It's the worst I've seen in my lifetime. Um, the withholding of military aid, all those bombs with heavy, heavy payloads, the withholding of intelligence, which we did in 2006, but not before or after that much. Um, all of the other things the U.S. is doing to, to express its dissatisfaction. 130 Congress members boycotted the Netanyahu speech, including the presumptive nominee of the Democratic Party. This is unheard of. That probable Democratic nominee, Kamala Harris, also met Netanyahu on Thursday. Although she shares Biden's commitment to supporting Israel, she's far more outspoken of her criticism of the war in Gaza. Will that translate into a change of US policy if she becomes president? And then there's Donald Trump. He's also called for a quick end to the war. But Trump was a staunch supporter of Israel during his first term and is likely to remain so if he wins a second one. But whoever occupies the White House next January it seems that support for Israel among the American public might not be quite as unwavering as it once was. John Brain, The Newsmakers, Washington.
So is continuing U.S. support for Netanyahu guaranteed, or has the unwavering U.S.-Israel relationship become a liability? Well, joining me now to debate that and more are from Washington radio talk show host and political analyst Garland Nixon, from Boston distinguished public policy fellow at the American University of Beirut and a non-resident fellow at the Arab Center in Washington, Rami Khoury, and from Tennessee, director of the Future of DHS Project at the Atlantic Council and also the former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Counterterrorism Policy at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Mr. Thomas Warwick. Thanks all so much uh, for being with me. Let's first establish where everyone stands really on Netanyahu being first given the opportunity to address Congress at this time and then your impressions of what he said. Garland, I'll start with you. Well, my um, first thoughts on uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu expressing, I mean, uh, you know, expressing his, his beliefs and thoughts um, at the U.S. Congress is it puts an exclamation mark on the uh, separation now between um, the American people and the government. There were numerous applauses. There was, you know, kind of unanimous uh, support of President of, uh, of, uh, of Benjamin Netanyahu and his policies. However, outside, the people were, you know, uh, freaking out. They were, you know, I you could argue protesting, rioting, all, all of the above. So there's unanimous, uh, very powerful um, uh, support amongst the Congress, amongst those who represent the ruling elite and the working class. I think there's a moral issue that the working class has been unable to resolve amongst themselves to support um, the Israeli mm. government. Tom, do you think that's fair? Did it really highlight kind of a great divide before, between where politicians are and what the American people actually want and feel. Uh, actually, I have a different view. Most of the uh, American public supports Israel. Uh, Republicans support it uh, almost unqualifiedly. Uh, but on the Democratic side, uh, especially among younger Democrats, uh, there is a greater concern over how Israel has fought uh, a war that was obviously forced upon it by the Hamas attack on October 7. It was noteworthy that about half of the Democratic members of the House and Senate chose not to attend, including most notably Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, uh, and so I think that that speaks to a different kind of concern among Democrats. Uh, but the support for Israel uh, as a country uh, and as an idea is still very strong in the United States. What many Americans want to see, though, uh, is the ceasefire, the return of the Israelis who were taken hostage by Hamas, uh, and most notably, a plan for what happens next. Mm. Uh, and this is the real issue that Washington is now debating. Yeah, that certainly wasn't addressed in his address. But, uh, Rami, let me turn to you. And if we actually look at the speech he, he, itself, and by the way, I do want to talk a lot more about Kamala Harris later, but, you know, Rami, so much of Netanyahu's address was recounting in detail what he says happened on October 7th. Is that the most convincing card to play still to a U.S. audience? You know, forget what's happened since. It's only about that day and everything thereafter is justified, especially because so many of the victims, they say, were actual U.S. citizens. You know, what's been happening in uh, U.S.-Israeli relations, or I should say U.S.-Israeli government relations, uh, because the Tom was correct to say, I think, that there's strong support for the security of Israel all over the world. In fact, the Arabs have all offered Israel security and peace uh, and open relations, but but Israel doesn't accept that. Uh, but So security of Israel is guaranteed. Uh, the problem is the government's policies, and the government's policies in recent years have gotten much, much worse. They've always been pretty bad since 67 in terms of uh, settlements, annexing uh, uh, territory, arresting thousands of Palestinians, um, uh, blowing up homes, and doing all the bad things that an occupation does. So the situation now is that uh, the, a majority, a small majority of Americans uh, wants a ceasefire right away opposes what Israel is doing, is essentially is saying, we, the U.S., do not want to be associated with a genocide. Um, and and, and uh, Netanyahu has wanted the International Criminal Court. Uh, and that's, the, that's the, uh, the, the big division. The style that he used in his speech uh, was a masterclass in, in traditional propagandistic rhetoric. 
which worked for about a century from 1920 till 2020, but it doesn't work anymore. In fact, one of the few places where that kind of speech works is in the Congress, because Israel's influence, let's say, uh, has been shrinking in recent years in the U.S., and it's focused still on the Congress and the White House. And what we saw yesterday in his meetings was that even his influence in the White House is shrinking. So this is an old uh, entertainer trying out all his tricks on the only audience that will give him that kind of applause. Right. I mean, but the applause, it didn't go unnoticed. That It was, it was just overwhelming. And there were, yes, a lot of members of Congress did not come, but a lot did. And if we look again, Rami, a little bit more at the content, you know, he, he made note of what he calls useful idiots um, that are siding with Iran's access of terror. You know, again, he's linking Hamas and Gaza to this wider threat. That means Americans are also in danger. And this is why the response of Israel is justified. I mean, there were no apologies whatsoever, not even an inkling of it. And no mention really of going forward toward a ceasefire um, and convincing, trying to convince, I guess, the, the wider U.S. public that what Israel is doing is actually protecting them, too. I, you call it propagandistic, but is it effective? Oh, I don't think it's effective beyond the small circle of right wing uh, fanatics. Uh, I mean, you know, the, his speech was like a, his performance in Congress was like a Trump rally. Um, with the same theatrics, the same rhetoric, the same lies, the same exaggerations. Okay, but I mean, um, this is the, the reality is Trump wins elections. Uh, let me ask uh, Garland what you think. Um, well, I think one of the things that stood out to me um, uh, demonstrated how people see Israel different from that differently. One of the mistakes I think he, he made was he said, you know, 1,200 people died from 41 countries. And I heard people say to me, 41 countries? You know, 41 countries in Israel and, you know, 41 countries there. And there is a historical context now where people, I found this, where people who knew nothing about Israel, nothing about um, Palestine, now have a historical context. And they're asking themselves, why is it that you have an area of um, the world that now the uh, ICJ, the Inter International Criminal uh, uh, Court of Justice, has ruled is an occupation where there's people from all over, all over the world coming there. And there is an indigenous people there who are dying by the tens of thousands. So one of the things that this particular, that the Israeli um, war uh, conflict um, has, has brought to the forefront is that people who did not understand, any, had no historical context now, have a historical context. And that's not working out in the best interest of um, those in the Israeli government who want to continue doing what they're doing. They're losing the people out here, working class, who were, to be quite frank, ignorant about I uh, Israel other than the kind of basic propaganda they got from mm -hmm. their government. Let me return to Tom, because I, I actually want to go back to, you're alluding to, to Kamala Harris. Um, she wasn't there, but then we've been hearing what she said in response. But we've been hearing it mostly in, in these kind of sound bites, I would say, that, that seem as if she's taking a harder line on Netanyahu, on Israeli policy. But if you, if you just heard kind of the opener of her response speech, you could actually guess to the contrary. I think. I, I mean, would would she at all change U.S. policy toward Israel, or is she just going to do the same as, as Biden, but with better <clears throat> PR? No, there is actually a substantive difference here. Uh, Joe Biden and his generation of Democrats uh, have supported Israel because they see Israel as 1967. Uh, they see it as a small country standing up against uh, larger outside forces intent on its destruction. Kamala Harris represents a younger generation of Democrats uh, who do support Israel. They do see positive aspects in a relationship that has gone back for more than 80 years. But at the same time, uh, they also think that Israel needs to be more open to eventual peace with Palestinians. One of the great tragedies of the Hamas attack on October 7, it is, is that it has put Israelis in a mind uh, that it's much harder to see them ever agreeing to a Palestinian state. This was in many ways uh, uh, as much a casualty of the war as the more than 1,000 Israelis and almost now 40,000 Palestinians who have died. 
Uh, but th there, there is one thing I do want to point uh, to because it struck me as very significant. Uh, this speech was given uh, in the afternoon in Washington, but it was intentionally chosen to be on prime time in Israel. This was as much for an Israeli audience as for the U.S. Congress. Uh, and the one thing that really struck out to me was Netanyahu said Gaza needs to be governed by Palestinians. This is a direct direct slap in the face at the hardline members of his own cabinet, mm -hmm. some of whom would like to see Gaza settled by Israelis. I think he's actually put an end to that idea. Let's see if this has any ramifications for uh, how Israel uh, thinks about post-war Gaza, because it could be very significant. It's, it would be one step towards a better future. Obviously, there are many more that need to be taken. Uh, but as a first step, I want to say that's actually a tiny bit of progress. Hmm. Rami, would you agree there? And it's also interesting to note. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how we can reconcile the the actual unpopularity of Netanyahu in Israel. We have most polls now saying around 70 percent of Israelis want him to resign uh, with this reception from from members of the U.S. Congress and, and pledges of continued support. Well, the, the reception of the Prime Minister of Israel in the U.S. Congress is separate from uh, direct uh, impact of current events, because the, Im the influence that the uh, Israelis and their PR machine working through APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, uh, their, their, their ability to uh, knock members of Congress out of Congress was just demonstrated in the Jamal Bowman. Uh, loss in the primaries in New York. So pe members of Congress will, will support Israel with great enthusiasm because they've seen many times Chuck Percy, Paul Finley, uh, Bohm, and many others, pe members of Congress who, who went against the grain of uh, full unquestioning support of Israel and, and lost because the Israeli machine was very effective uh, using perfectly legal means in the U.S., lobbying and fu funding, etc. So that's... So I wouldn't... Uh, confuse support for Israeli prime minister with the total uh, relationship uh, with Israel. But Tom is correct, I think, saying we are seeing some significant symbols, at least, or tentative steps or hints at real important policy changes. Um, the focus on the immediate ceasefire was one. What struck me, and the Gaza control was possibly another one, what struck me about her comments was she was the first senior American official in my 50 years of covering this uh, conflict uh, since I was in college in the 1960s in the U.S. First time I've ever seen a senior American official, official talk about the Palestinians as human beings. She humanized them, uh, even in death and suffering. She talked about them in real human terms. The whole philosophy of Zionism is to dehumanize Palestinians and make them invisible, that they don't exist, they don't have rights. This is a sign that maybe a change here is coming. And her call for self-determination and statehood so explicitly, uh, presumably with the support of the president of the U.S., is also very significant. But all of this is rhetoric so far. Mm -hmm. It's words, and words are easy to use. There's going to be huge pressure on her to take some practical steps to start translating the words into, into policy. And this is going to impact uh, how the uh, uncommitted movement in the primaries of last January, February, how they respond uh, to her and whether they'll vote for her while they said they would not vote for Biden because of the genocide that the U.S. is supporting. So th th we are in a really strategic, important moment. Indeed. Uh, you know, Garland, if, ultimately... If if I, if I may comment yeah, on something that Mr. Work said about Kamala Harris and who she represents, right? Okay, Kamala, Har Kamala Harris symbolically represents women of color. Symbolically, she represents young people. But materially, I believe that a lot of the working class out here believe that, that materially, she she represents um, some of the same factions that are basically running the party now, that she represents the Clinton people, that she represents a very wealthy ruling elite. And so there, the, I think what has happened, uh, Barack Obama symbolically represented young people and symbolically represented people of color, but materially nothing of 
of, of substance change for these people. I think the days when you can give rhetoric and symbolism to the American people and expect them to accept it are behind them. Right now, the American people are not upset over women of color or things of that nature. They're upset, A, because the, for, over two big things, their uh, uh, material interest, the way they live um, is mm. declining. Their standard of living is declining. And number two, regarding Israel, they're upset because of the moral actions. People are being murdered, men, women, and children by the tens of thousands. So the American people, you can give them all the rhetoric, rhetoric you want if they're watching an immoral crisis of genocide that they believe is genocide mm. and their lives are going downhill, they're not going to support some symbolic new woman of color um, based on her rhetoric. Okay, and this is the problem. Tom, I'll come back to you. They're not going to support that woman, according to Garland. And ultimately, in the U.S., there is just no recourse uh, for U.S. complicity in any of what's happening in Gaza. Attempted lawsuits have failed. International law doesn't really apply. So there will be no consequences except for maybe being punished at the ballot box. But in this case, well, that would only give Trump an advantage, which will ultimately make things far worse for Palestinians. Well, but let, let me uh, pour cold water on the idea that Donald Trump is somehow going to be a friend to Palestinians. The concern that many of us have uh, is that is is that if Smotrich and Ben Gavir are still in office in February in Israel, uh, they intend to proceed with annexation of all or most of the West Bank, uh, incorporating it into sovereign Israeli territory. Uh, all of the indications are that the people around Donald Trump would be just fine with that, uh, uh, even though the people who are around him in his first term actually tried to hold that up. Uh, the really shocking thing is it's possible to see under a Trump administration, uh, nothing would be done to hold up the annexation of the West Bank, mm -hmm. uh, whereas a Harris administration would quite literally pull out of all of the stops uh, to make sure that something like that could never happen. Uh, because she is, uh, Rami is right, she is committed to thinking about Palestinians uh, uh, in the way she would like to see everyone else treated as people who deserve rights and people to whom there has been injustice, as indeed injustice has been done uh, to Jews historically, and this is why Israel is is so well supported in the United States. So I, I think we are on the bridge of real substantive change, uh, but the change will have to come uh, not just in Israel and the United States, but among Palestinians uh, and among Arabs. There are signs uh, this week that that actually is beginning to start. Uh, when the United Arab Emirates summoned American and Israeli leaders to Abu Dhabi to talk about a serious proposal for the day after, uh, that's a groundbreaking development. Uh, it's been a long time since something like that has been done by Arab leaders. And we really ought to recognize, I think, that there is a small path towards a lasting peace. And we need to make that path wider uh, and, frankly, uh, turn it into a superhighway. Okay. But, I mean, Rami, as Tom said, Trump will be no friend to the Palestinians. And it seems like Netanyahu could just be biding his time you know, hoping for a Trump victory, in which case Gaza could very much be done with. He will open the door for settlers to come back in, probably with U.S. financial support. You know, the weapons flow would not stop. Um, and meanwhile, those people that Garland were talking about who are not impressed with Kamala Harris and just think it's more of the same and they are controlled by the wrong forces that are in none of the working class interest, much less uh, Palestinians' interest, they will punish that party, the Democrats, by perhaps not voting and giving Trump, as I said, an advantage in this upcoming election. So where does all of this leave Gaza, leave the peace process? Because it's just months away. Well, it leaves it where it's always been, as a, 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 an instrument of Western white northern racist apartheid colonial powers uh, who have manipulated the Middle East and other regions of the South for uh, centuries. Um, you know, this Palestine cause has generated massive international support uh, all over the world, people support it. And the reason is that the whole of the global South sees this as the last anti-colonial battle. Um, and, and they want to win this battle. They want to win it by 
reaching a point where you have Israelis and Palestinians each living securely in recognized sovereign states. Um, what, what Netanyahu tried to do was to, in his speech, uh, is sh show that Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran and all these people and ISIS, they're all evil people together and, and we've got to defeat them. This has been attempted three, four times in the last 40 years, where the U.S. has tried to make alliances with Arabs and Israelis either against the Russians or against Saddam Hussein or against Iran or against terrorism or against whatever. And it just doesn't work very well because the Palestine issue resonates so deeply. So it's got to be resolved. And Trump is absolutely no friend of Palestinians. Tom is right. The top, Trump uh, brought in the, well, the worst period for Palestine mm -hmm. uh, in recent years with all of the <clears throat> moves that he and, and his son-in-law, uh, uh, Jared Kushner, made. Uh, so, but the argument that if they... Uh, progressive Democrats are angry at America's involvement in the genocide and don't vote for Biden, they're going to elect Trump. The answer is that is let them elect Trump. If the Americans have Trump, they will. This is a country that has to deal with the consequences of its actions. And if, and if the message is that any president who supports actively and enthusiastically, as Biden has, a genocide, uh, they're not going to get our vote. And if that happens once, it leaves a lasting impression because this uncommitted movement which started in Michigan and Wisconsin has now grown to be a national movement and they're actively working okay. now to make sure that so this is where we are. Rami, that will have to be the final word for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists so much for being with me. Greatly appreciate it. Our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on X and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.